Okay. I just want to know what it's like to be inside your head. Me um, too. You ever been in a, a clothing store, and, and you get there, and you suddenly realize <laughs> that you're not in a clothing store at all, you're actually in a car dealership, and you've taken off everyone's jackets? That's your mind. That's my mind. <laughs> Hello, and welcome to this episode of the Alien Familiar RPG Podcast. I am Clayton. Back in the side saddle again, your old friend Kyle Perkins. Woo! Hey, this is Haley. You can follow me at Bay of the Fay. Back. Good to be back. Uh, and I'm Lenina. Uh, I'm Katie. I never leave. <laughs> <laughs> and this is actually a part two of our discussion. Okay. I just want to know what it's like to be inside your head. Me um, too. Have you ever been in a, a clothing store? And, and you get there, and you suddenly realize that you're not in a clothing store at all. You're actually in a car dealership, and you've taken off everyone's jackets. That's your mind. That's my mind. <laughs> Discussion on good on paper, bad in execution. Um, as I am recording this, I don't know exactly where I'm going to cut the um, episode in half, but here you go. So we talked a lot about what game masters and GMs and all the other fun names you can call people that run games can do. Storyteller, game Storyteller. narrator. Yep. Nerd. Um, nerd. Head nerd. Chief nerd, even. Director. Director nerd. Yeah. Um, but what about are some things that, as a player, are good on paper, but bad in execution? Don't play a pacifist. <laughs> okay. You, you're pretty, you feel pretty strongly about that one. I've played... Three pacifists in my in my time, and one of them wasn't even really a pacifist. She was just a very soft healer, and so she wouldn't fight. And luckily, it worked out because I had two legitimate anime characters on my team. And all I we ever play is anime games, guys. Like I don't know why you come to us for advice. Like we're just weebs. <laughs> uh, and so it, it worked out well enough there to just be like, oh no, don't hurt people if you don't have to, but I guess I'll stand over here and let you smile. <laughs> um, unless you hurt the forest, and then like I would lose my cool and punch your face out, because she was just very, very soft. But um, I played a pacifist in our game. Was it... Abena? You... Yeah. Okay. I don't remember. The... We used Savage, Savage Worlds yeah. systems. Uh, for some reason, it just got into my mind that I had to play this character. I don't know what came over me or why. We had previously decided to uh, make a mercenary group. Yes, a, a pacifist in a game where everybody is going to play characters who are a mercenary company. And I was fine with uh, violence in general. I just didn't want to get my hands dirty, which is a weird way to play a pacifist in general. It was a good idea in my head, to be, like, the healer that does all of the techie things to the side while everybody else punches people. But, you know, in reality, it just... I just stood there a lot of the time while everybody just got hit. There was even a point because of my issue of fear of fire that I was thrown. That was great. Excuse yourself. Uh, just literally thrown around the entire game. And then it's nobody's fault but my own. Because for some reason, I... I think that being a pacifist could work out if you're not... In a combat-centric game. In a combat-centric game. Sort of to, to tie on and maybe do a little bit of, of point-counterpoint, I also played a pacifist in a Savage Worlds game. It was in the Savage Worlds superhero setting. I'm not sure if anyone at the table is oh. familiar. Was it Necessary Evil or was it just a superheroes game? Uh, it was just a superhero game. <clears throat> um, and I, was, I wasn't I was just a pacifist. I was like the tier two uh, one where I was like a hyper pacifist. Mm. So I couldn't even indirectly hurt people. Um, and interestingly enough, this fate game was apparently now the second time I've played Constantine the Ninth. Because I played <laughs> Constantine the Ninth in... The superhero game, because I took the immortal trait, and I was like, yeah, he just lives forever. I'm playing I'm playing him. Uh, anyway, but it worked out fine for me. I was the group healer, um, and like we didn't really have a dedicated combat character. It was bad. The, the game itself was kind of a clown fiesta. Uh, <laughs> we made three sessions, maybe. Yeah, but we made at least like a mid-game point, so maybe like four or five? Did we? I don't remember. Because there was a big mid-game finale fight. Oh... 
against the bee people? Do you remember that? The bee people! I do remember the bee people. I was some sort of a You're like techno a, Yeah, like a hacker technomancer. Techno... Mage. Uh, I don't know. I don't remember what it's called. It's like the thing where you move things with your mind, but it's... Telekinesis? But it's technokinesis. Telekin- technokinesis. Kind of. Now, I don't know why this worked out well for me. I, I think it might have been because maybe I, I broke the Savage Worlds thing a little bit because I had all those, like, you can never hurt anyone stuff, right? Mm-hmm. And, like, you also get the superhero template where you get a couple things, but the only big thing my guy had besides some, like, rid- like, like the basic healing template and the immortal was that those were it. And so I was able to take a fuck ton of, like, charisma stuff, too. And so I think I was just able to kind of, like, talk our way out of anything that we really, like, got into, which is maybe why playing the pacifist worked out. Because if you're playing a pacifist and you come up against someone that you can just talk down, it's really easy to play a pacifist. Mm-hmm. So maybe that was why I had such a good time with it. Um, well, it, if playing your pacifist character fit the campaign and fit the other players' way um, styles of play, maybe that worked, and I think that could work. Equally as important to, okay, everyone's playing paladins, and I'm going to play a necromancer to be different. <laughs> Sounds great on paper. Not gonna work. Um, um, it on paper it does. Um, in paper and in practice, it can work in three third edition D and D because uh, the goddess Weejoss is lawful neutral, and she does have the death domain. So you can literally play a lawful good necromancer. Oh, like a cleric, kind of. Yes, huh. a lawful good necromatic cleric. I had that idea shot down because the game master didn't think that um, that the rules, like, thought that it was against the rules, but um, in the rules of D&D, the only cleric who it, um, says that they are not allowed to play, um, the only lawful neutral deity who is sp- explicitly says you cannot play a particular um, alignment is the clerics of St. Cuthbert. They are not allowed to be evil. It doesn't say anything about that for uh, Weejoss. She is lawful neutral. She is a goddess of death and magic. And you can play a cleric, a lawful good cleric of death and magic. My I'm, little rant. That sounds once. amazing. So what do you fucking ask for consent before you raise the skeleton? Well, what you're doing she's, is because she's all, God told you to. It's different. She's also the goddess of marriage. You marry the Skellington, Kyle. <laughs> and now that's just a Tim Burton movie. <laughs> um, Nina, marry the Skellington. Yeah. <laughs> what were you anyway. going to say, Nina? Uh, I feel like playing a pacifist in games where you don't really talk about it prior is also bad because it ends up if you do talk your way out of everything, and then the other characters kind of get shipped to the side during combat situations or other situations like that, because I do remember ha- that happening a lot. Um, unless you're, unless that pacifist is outnumbered, which happened to me in that one game, but I do remember you're just like, no, 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 no fighting. I'm going to talk to them. And then everybody else was just like, I guess, okay. And we all sat back as he talked his way through most situations. We're just like, I guess we just won't use our character. Yeah, there was a like real hothead that was playing like Fireboy uh, and he was like, I'm t- really mad all the time, you know? And and by the end of the game, he was like, yeah, I actually love Kumbaya. Uh, I really enjoy having uh, the immortal Byzantine Emperor talk through all of our problems. And I was like, damn fucking straight. Now go sit over there and make some bead crafts. <laughs> <laughs> Think about what you've done. <laughs> anyway, that's that was my story playing pacifist. Uh, but I think Nina is right in that, as you just heard from another person that played in that game, it was like an, it was the inverse of what normally tends to happen with the pacifist, right? Like the pacifist on the sideline, I was just such an effective face character, and the GM, to his fault, I would say, was too willing to let me like just be like, "You evil doer, stop," you know. And rather than have them maybe be convicted in their actions, if I rolled high enough on charisma, he'd just be like, "Oh shit, you cascaded twice." Yeah, he just listens, you know. Uh, so, so I have had four in, um, encounters with pacifist characters. One of which was mine. One of which was Nina's <laughs> or Lenina's. My pacifist character was in third edition D anD. d I used the Book of Exalted Deeds. Um, I made a level one bard who had a plus twenty two in 
persuasion. What? Be, or not persuasion, diplomacy, before I rolled. Wow. I've so never wanted to do something no, where my life. Fail. I, yeah, it was very diff- If I rolled a one, I got a 23 result on my persuasion. I've heard some strange things about that, of like, even if you have that, it's still a critical fail. I don't the, know. It is, it, it, that is a house rule, that a one on a skill check is a failure. Back on topic. Um, <laughs> the other passive, one of the other pacifists that I've seen, Jordan actually played a pacifist what? once. Mm-hmm. Yes. Was it the he, death monk? It was the monk in the Planescape game before he switched to playing Morovig, the, um, oh, yeah. the Ubermensch. The I Ubermensch. remember that. <laughs> before that campaign crashed and burned. The first time I ever saw a player play a fa- pacifist was the only time I saw it work. Um, this was a vampire game, and the player played a pacifist character who made zero attack rolls throughout an entire chronicle. They were um, a pacifist vampire? Were they vegan? They, they still drank blood, but they did not engage in any sort of combat whatsoever. How high they, was their manipulation? We did not share our stats with each other, so okay. I have no idea how <laughs> high her, uh, her manipulation, or how high... The character was a male. His char- his manipulation was. I don't remember how high that was. Hmm. Uh, a fun note about Jordan's pacifist real quick. He did something very <laughs> clever, I thought. Uh, he's not here, so I can say that. I don't want him to hear the fucking compliment. Um, <laughs> uh, he was being chased by, I think, two of these kind of, like, weird, demonic, sort of shambling creatures um, that had just, like, slaughtered a family, I think. Yeah. Um, his character, you know, was trying to reason with them and trying to like uh, ask them where they came from. And he, he, his character thought that they might be like creatures in suffering that could be cleansed and dis, you know, disbanded that uh, by by cleansing them of their evil. Uh, but in the meantime, he's being fucking chased and about to be wailed upon. And so he um, was an elf. I want to say. I don't recall. Well, somehow he successfully got on the other side of a big bramble patch, uh, and these things were too stupid to go around it, and so these things just entangled themselves in the brambles, taking Not, damage. This was in Planescape, but it wasn't just brambles, that was Razor Vine. Oh, sick, so, yeah. Only people who play Planescape will get that reference, and I'm not going to explain it. Ha ha ha. <laughs> Google um, it later. So yeah, so he, he basically led them, he slowed them down, and they took damage by going through this Razor Vine while he tried to talk them out of being evil, you know. Interesting. Yeah. So I wanna go back, Katie, you had mentioned playing the uh the superheroes game. Um I am not saying that One Punch Man copied me. <laughs> but oh, <okay. laughs> ten years ago I did have a char- character <laughs> concept for a character called the Passa Fist. <laughs> who, <laughs> who was a pacifist up until the point where he, I mean, it was basically like One Punch Man was was the concept. I never, I never got to actually play it, but it was a concept that was rolling around in my head. Mm. That's pretty cool. I just, the I, I was, fist. I was so proud of that name. Yeah, it's very good. <laughs> so to transition further, uh, we talked about like pacifist. Now, pacifist is let's let's expand on this because pacifist is one type of character. That you can play in a game. Yeah, right? and this is... I would consider this to be a type of player with a severe disadvantage. Mm-hmm. And I've got quite a few other characters who I've either been or seen play that have had severe disadvantages. Um, for instance, I played a half-orc bard who was a deaf mute. So you in, couldn't in third, hear your own music. Third edition. Yeah. Listen, Beethoven could do it, so could you. Suck it up. What? I was I was deaf from birth. <laughs> Because my human father was um, severely drunk for a large portion of his life. When he finally sobered up, he realized that he was married to an orcish woman and had a half orc child oh, no. and screamed and made the child made the infant child deaf. That was my backstory as to why I was deaf. Wait, why? Like, <laughs> Wait he story. saw the kid pop out and was just like <laughs> Wait, hold on, no, no, I like that like it was even after that. No, it like, was he, after he, that. he sobered up one morning and he was like Looks He's, to his left, sees the orcish woman. Looks to his like right in the crib, sees small yes. Clayton, and is like, <laughs> Jesus! Wow, what Your a poor dead. little orcish ears couldn't handle it. Exactly. How, 
Absolutely. So, okay, we're gonna, I, I, this is a semantic question, but how the fuck is this guy so drunk <laughs> that he didn't notice his son was a half-orc until, how old were you, would you say? Yeah, still an infant. Okay, so like, clearly after the birth. Right. Well, that means for nine months at least. I don't know. I don't know. He, the, it was the hell of a bender. Wow. Fair enough. That is that is a hell. I don't know how long an orc takes to conceive, but I'm going to assume it's the same as a human. Nine, nine months. months of not realizing he had fathered a child with an orc. Also, he, it sounds like he was living. Maybe, maybe yeah. marriage is too much, but he was definitely living with this person. This this fine okay? nice orcish woman. Was she okay? Did she get she murdered? Was, she was fine. She was a very overbearing mo- mother, and this character uh, went off to school to basically get away from his mother, but oh. she followed. <laughs> I love it. So that was one severe disadvantage. I've also had players play, like, the blind monk trope. Oh, I've um, definitely played a blind in, character. In, yeah, in 3.5, a blind monk. You didn't die. In 3.5, yeah, a blind monk. That's kind of terrifying. Yeah. What, what made you want to do that? I did not play this character. Um, I had I was the game master in this game, and the the player wanted to play. Oh, okay, a, that's fair. A blind monk. There is something alluring about like this daredevil esque character, yeah. right? Like, there's a reason why daredevil is considered a popular hero, to an extent, I guess. Like, mm-hmm. there, there's just something, and or the blind monk kung fu archetype, right? Or the blind swordsman. Right. The, but the problem is. In a role-playing game, like it's so hard to pull off because it is it is a major it's a major handicap, and I'm not like obviously I'm not blind, so I don't know how it is living everyday life as someone that is blind. But know. mechanically I can but mechanically I can say you have to guess at which square an individual is in, and even if you guess the correct square, there's a fifty percent chance that you're going to miss. Even uh, if you hit. In a Final Fantasy game once, I was playing a summoner but my summoner was blind, and the GM neglected to tell me that that also meant any summons I had were blind. <sighs> so I was the most useless summoner ever, because I would summon fucking, like, Iblis, and he'd show up with raging fire, and then I'd have to keep rolling fucking a D100 percentile dice to see if he actually hits his intended target or if he burns the party. Mm. So, yeah, blind Why characters. Why would your summons be blind? In Final Fantasy, for whatever reason, the summons take on, like, it's basically a mechanical thing, so if you're fighting a summoner, right, you and you use a blind, a temporary blind ability, mm-hmm. it's gonna affect the summoner and the summonee, oh, right? Okay. But because I had purposely made myself blind, they showed up with the blind status affliction oh, no. constantly because my character was blind, but that's just, anyway. So yeah, like, that is, that is a case of, I was like, man... It'd be cool to play, like, some... Because I figured, had, being a summoner, that wouldn't happen. I was like, these creatures can come out and fight for me and, and do things that I can't do. And I thought that was sort of the crux of the character. Uh, but... Alas. Alas, that was not true. So, But I think that that does sort of, to, to expand on that idea, like, does anyone else have examples of characters that either had a major disadvantage or that just, like... Like me, you know, like, I thought would th- you thought something would be cool or work well on paper, but then you actually tried it out and you're like, this sucks. Like, besides a pacifist. Um, I wanted to, I, I normally play a lot of characters that are very driving and independent. It's like, I don't need help from any of the other players. I'm going to go off and do my own thing. I'm a strong independent woman. Strong player. independent woman. And I wanted to play a character that was very ally heavy. I, I would never. I want to play someone that, you know, was very much so like let's work together. And I statted them out to be like, very, like all of their things work with like bonuses and support because that's what they were. And it failed miserably in practice because I am a manipulative person, and everyone took all of my charismatic things and allyship as manipulation and backstabbing. And I also, uh, it was a vampire, the masquerade. It was from the LARP and the character that I wanted to make, um, she had a level three blood bond to one of the bad guys and she couldn't act in her own story. I literally needed other people to act on behalf of my character 
because I had so many negs. I couldn't physically do things. Somebody else to act or give you instruction. Yes. And not giving myself mechanical agency was was definitely a flaw. I should have put in, like, a loophole to work around it, or at least not had it so much as, like, straight-up damsel of distress. I wanted her to be like, I can work with other people so we can collectively come together and work through this goal, and rather so than paper, I need other people to do you it. you thought having a blood bond to one of the bad guys would be a good idea? Uh, for story flavor, it was perfect. You could go fuck yourself. The problem is, is that I care more about creating a good story than having a playable character, and that was my flaw, I guess. Because it made a really cool fucking story. But an RPG for, is not just a story. It made a very fucking cool story for everyone except for you, and that was your character. Yeah, and it really sucked, and it really... Uh, that might be the most up. severe disadvantage we have to talk about in this section. Wow, I'm going to blood bond myself to the villain so that I do whatever the villain says. Yeah, yeah it was a level like, three blood like, bond, which is the most intense. Um, there was a point in the final battle where um, the, the, I was basically being used as a human shield. It's like, yeah, hey, Jillian, come over here. Just take a step to the left. And I had to. Like, I just could not say no. What if you'd given yourself, like, a level one or two blood bond? Would you think would that have changed your perception of this at all? Would Perhaps, you fight it better? but I also think the problem that I was doing is that I was focusing so much more on the flavor text and the story and the confliction that my character's being like, hey, I I can't fight him on my own. I, like, let's work together. This is what I can give you. Let's, like, he's gonna threaten this community. And I was like, no, this is your problem. You brought him here because he just, this is your blood bond. We don't care about you. You're manipulative. You're just trying to use this for your powers and then get rid of us. And I'm like, no, that's not it at all. I want us to, like, come together as a party and, like, work through this thing. And it was just overall... I made an ally character in a game where people were focusing more on the collection of power rather than trying to come together as a community. And that really sucked. Because that character's still, ideally, one of my favorite characters I've played. But I let her get sidetracked, and I didn't... And I... My tendencies of playing more manipulative characters got the best of me. And... I failed her, I guess, on paper. I, I failed her in execution. Um, well, I, I don't know if if you failed, because it sounds like you set yourself up for failure, and I'm, I'm not hating on the decision. No, I like, mean, that's, I, I that's think that what I'm saying. I think that was bold of you to do. For, it's something like, I wanted to try. Play. I guess my point is, is like I don't see how... Uh, unless you were literally be willing to be like, yep, I'm going to sit most of this game out and kind of like make the experience better for everyone else, mm -hmm. how even in, in on paper, that, like, was not going to go over well. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Well, my idea with uh, Jolene, uh, the character, was I know that she has severe handicaps when dealing with these certain people, so my goal was to get as many allies, get as many friends, get them as close-knitted, and then be like, this is a problem. I can give you all the information. I can't physically do this thing on mm -hmm. my own. So you were so like I, trying to like, yeah, gather kind of yeah, trying to be that gathering force, and it just failed miserably. Is there a way to undo blood bonds in that game? There is not. Um, in Child. the games that I've been running, I homebrewed some shit because I've dealt with blood bonds before, but it's not the game I was running. This is a game I was playing in. See, I think had like you gave yourself that level three blood bond at the beginning, mm -hmm. and then like made it your goal to be like, I'm going to get out of this by the end of the game. Yeah. Like, that'd be like a That's little That's what I, I literally you know? like went to the DM and was like, she's trying spells. She's doing like sabbat rituals. Like, how do I get out of this? And there was just nothing I could do. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I really, I really cooked my own goose on that one. There is always one thing you can do, and that is find some way to get your master killed. That's, that was the thing is that um, she's like, <clears throat> because of the blood bond, it's like you are... Like, emotionally, physically, just, like, everything, like, very attracted to that person. And at a level three, you would die for them. You'd rather kill yourself than see them die. So the problem is, is that everyone's like, well, we'll just kill him. And she's like, no, wait, I, I can't physically tell you to do that. And everyone took that and was like, oh, you're manipulative. You're the true master. It was just real bad. It was real bad. <laughs> um, 
but the pr- I, I guess my intentions and the mechanics got the best of me, I guess. Um, that was the intention, to get rid of that guy. Just kill him. But I thought that the allies and friends I had collected were were allies and friends, and then it turns out that wasn't the case. I see all one kind of other angle to look at mm-hmm. where this was good on paper but doesn't work in real life, and that's just having a character who was either high charisma or master, man- master manipulator, and then expecting that to work on other players. Yeah, I absolutely agree, and I think the problem is, is that in that game, it was slowly very much so becoming obvious that it was going to turn player versus player. Um, that everyone was just out to get as much power. Oh, and... so, so you mean a vampire game? <laughs> yeah, a vampire game. But um, when we were originally playing it, the goal of the campaign, as proposed, was we were set. We were coming together to set up a new kind of vampire society. And I was also playing an Artarchus, which uh, for people who aren't familiar with Vampire the Masquerade, um, there are like uh, sects, which are like these are my ideals. This is what I believe in. Yada yada yada. I'm sticking to this. Anyone who doesn't agree with me, they can die. And Artarchus is someone who says, I don't want any of these beliefs. I just want to do my own thing. I don't want to get involved. And those, um, there's a severe bias against playing those kind of characters. And because I wouldn't pick a side, um, nobody wanted to play ball. I should have, I really should have caved in. I was like, this is the character I made on paper. I would like to see this through. And I wasn't flexible enough in changing that. If I had just been like, I'm just going to be an Anarch, why not? It really sucked trying to play a character that was independent who just didn't want to deal with sex and then being punished because of that. That really sucked. It almost comes down to sex. Yeah. <laughs> I, keep hear- I kept hearing you say sex, too. And I'm mm-hmm. like, oh! a character that didn't want to have sex. S-E-C-T-S, well, friends. This is a family show. Uh, <laughs> is it? <laughs> no, it is At not. At what point has this ever been a family show? <laughs> we have the we explicit- had a child on once. Did um, we? Cosette. We have the explicit oh, tag. I, we are not a family I, show. I don't know if Cosette podcasted, but she did, uh, well, the actual play, yes. Yeah, she was Correct. in the actual play. Um, KP got yes. anything to toss into the ring? Um, Get that hat off that you're not wearing and just throw it in there. Here, I'll give you my hat. You can, like, throw it. I don't really have any stories about this particular subtopic, um, but it, it's a pretty good... Time to maybe transition over into our last one, the One Trick Ponies Min Max Power Gaming, because I've got quite a bit to say about that. Mm. I'm sure. aware of that. So, first off, I want to clear up what it means to Min Max versus Power Gaming. I know we had some so, thoughts on that. So, I just want to say that you are going to end this internet debate that has been going on for decades. Go. Right now. This is it. <laughs> All the pressure's on you. These next words will define a generation. Are you ready? Yeah. <laughs> okay, there we go. Panic. 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 Right. Panic. So we had a bit of a debate about this before the mic turned on. Because apparently I can't have opinions and be right. Until they're recorded. Yeah. Who said you're not allowed to have opinions? As soon as I was just like, this is what Min-Max is, you went into a spiel about, like, no, it's not, this is what it is. I, I'm i also him. allowed to have opinions. Don't, don't factor him in. He doesn't exist. Don't look at him. He's not here. This okay, is not, okay. This is in, in the left corner, Nina's opinions. Go. I don't know like this. Don't do this to me. In the right corner, Katie. I always have opinions. So, <laughs> um, all right. In my mind, min-maxing refers to... Because the, t- the title of this topic for the podcast is Good on Paper, Bad in Execution. And I, and I made the argument that I think a min-max character, in, in this case being someone that maximizes one aspect while knowingly minimizing another aspect in doing so. Yeah, really good at combat, can't, like, can't talk. literally like a, like a four charisma on or a scale. Or really low intelligence. Uh, you know, really, yeah. really charismatic. As soon as it turns to fighting, they fucking fall over and die. It, that, that sort of thing. In my mind, I didn't think a min-max character was an example of good on paper, bad in execution, because you're knowingly... And, and the way we defined this topic earlier, it was... Oh, I think this is going to be really good on paper uh, for this, this, and this reason. And then you start playing, and all of a sudden it's not. Um, But a min-maxer is like, well, I know I'm going to be pretty ass at at intelligence rolls, but God, am I going to be great at combat. 
And so in that case, but and that's what they had on paper, and I would probably say 95% of the time, you're going to go into the game, and that's going to be what you, what, you, what you put on paper is what you're going to get. Because mm-hmm. you've efficiently made that character that way. That's the point of a min-max. And so I've heard min-maxing as a verb. Well, actually, I, I guess also an adjective. Um, but, you know, oh, so-and-so keeps min-maxing their, their characters. I've heard that as a way to describe power gaming you you willingly take some bullshit negative that doesn't matter in order to give yourselves positives that really do matter clayton had a pretty good example of of that that was funny i thought um in the game of gurps you have you have a disadvantage where you can just not taste anything yeah whoop de fucking do right like in, in in real life horrible terrible i want my my i want my bolognese it's pasta i want to taste it but in a fucking rpg you never taste anything. Uh, you don't even eat half the time. <laughs> Dude, you'd be really good story. at oral sex. You... <laughs> <laughs> oh! Cool thought there. Um, you could also so just win you, a lot of So you just turned a negative into a positive. Min Max and baby! Wow. <laughs> yeah, you just don't have any negatives. Pineapple. Okay. Eat a lot of pineapple. That's, that's all you need. Um... <laughs> so yeah, taking bullshit negatives that don't matter in order to buff up your combat stats or get your charisma to like 25 or some stupid shit. That's what I've kind of heard it as. And ultimately it didn't matter, but I, I didn't mean to fucking spark a debate between the couple at the table here. I just thought it was an interesting discussion about what is min-maxing versus power gaming. Um, I guess ultimately they're not the same thing. Not from what I know, uh... My experience with Min Max is just like, oh, I want to be really good at this, and so what if I'm bad at that? But then you play the character, and you're like, oh, I could have used all of these things that I didn't touch at all. And then, especially if you walk into a game and the people around you don't, like, balance out your Min Max, you guys are just wandering around doing things and not progressing plot, and you're not able to do anything because nobody decided to talk about their characters, and now you're just dying or punching your way through walls because you can't figure out how to open a locked door. The the group made a bunch of frenzied berserkers and there's no match there's no wizard to handle anything else. <laughs> mm-hmm. It's basically it and from my experience I've never had good luck with like a character that's good at just one thing mm-hmm. unless other players fall into line, and then it's just like, you have to follow my character's lead. Well, and that ends up happening with power gaming min-maxers. If it turns out that the campaign has a lot of tasks that the power-gamed character is really good at, then that player becomes kind of the de facto decision-maker and and the de facto leader. Um, If someone has such a high charisma and they're an extremely vocal player, and all they want to do is, I talk my way out of the situation, but we need to fight the... Th- Rolls dice, clatter, clatter, clatter. Oh, yeah, 27. Um, okay, yeah, you convince the police to lay down their... Actually, they, they give you their guns and handcuffs. They're yours now. You're the police now. Um, <laughs> it is, and, I'm done. It's been my experience that the the character you're describing of the person who min-maxes their character like that, they are often the player who is sitting at the table with the more dominant personality. Mm. So, in a normal game, they're they're the ones dictating pretty much where things are going. And whenever they min-max, it becomes even worse because suddenly they are a hammer and <laughs> everything god is damn nail. it, everything is going to be a nail. From the not super vocal character on the sideline, it's just not fun because it just gives that player more reasons to go forth and do whatever they want. Mm-hmm. An instance where I might recommend a character or a player make a min maxed character would be a very passive player, a very shy player. If they want to have that one thing that whenever it comes up in the game, they step forward and they do. That gives them more spot. That potentially gives them more spotlight because ev- potentially everybody else at the table knows. Well, whenever we get into a combat, this person needs to be right there doing this thing. Mm-hmm. It gives you spotlight without having to actually request it or seek it. it it's an automatic it. like, oh, we know this person is our best lock picker, and so anytime there's that, you know, like you don't have to be like, I can do that. 
the group will be like, oh, hey, Steve, you want to come up here and fucking... I mean, surely, surely the master of, of unlocking w- would want these lockpicks um, to, to unlock the door. Could call him a Jill sandwich. A Steve sandwich. Yeah. <laughs> Having said that, I've also been in the situation where the player, the quiet player, is the one who is absolutely perfectly built for the best situation, but the more forceful personality character or hmm. player is like, well... I've got a plus two in my open lock. Let me get up there and do mm. it. I'll give it the old college try. <laughs> well, damn it, this didn't work. I break the door down. Basically. It's just... I mean, but I also think that these things that we're currently talking about um, are also symptoms of uh, of a wider issue of personalities at the table. Yeah. Like, min-maxing is one thing, but, like, at the end of the day, like... That dude with the plus two lock picking, if he is the dominant force at the table, is going to be like, I'll get up there and give it a shot, you know, and like do that before the person with the plus 16 in lock picking that maybe isn't as vocal has mm-hmm. a chance to say anything. Like, that's just, that's just shitty. And it's just unfortunately like how the personalities at the table are playing out. So I don't, I don't think that's so much a symptom of min maxing as that is like dominant dyna- yeah. dynamics. If you're going to knowingly create a fucking power gamed best at X or just best period character. You need to have the right mentality about it. You need to not be a dickhead and you need to realize that let's say you make the best combat character by sacrificing some charisma ability to speak. Um, a true power gamer would be the best at everything, but you know, you, you're a great combat character. You're a terrible speaker. You need to just be aware that, hey, you're not going to be talking. And when it comes time to go into the great hall of the lord you're serving at the time, you're going to give up the spotlight to the talky characters. And and as long as you're fine with that, you know, know, know that going into it. Your ideas on paper, if they're flawed or if there are holes in that idea then you're going to encounter some times when you have a hole in gameplay. You're not going to be able to actually do anything. That brings up, I guess, another point of, like, what if people min-max the same way, and then you're basically fighting over who gets to pick the lock? Mm-hmm. Especially if you're all just, like, fighty characters, and you're all just like, oh, that combat lasted a solid five minutes, now what are we going to do? And that can be mitigated with the GM, you know? Give them two doors. You got two lock pickers. here's two doors. Each of you take one. You fucks. I stop fighting and trying to stick each lock pick in the lock. So before we wrap up the topic, um, I want to talk a little bit about one thing that I have been doing for a couple of years now to try to mitigate, at least from the player's side, of having a great idea on paper and then discovering that, oh shit, this doesn't work at all. Particularly in the instance of players who are new to a game system, because whenever you're new to a game system, you're not going to know, for instance, what skills are going to be absolutely vital in that system. Or you're not going to know that a particular combination of stats are just not going to give you the concept that you wanted to play. Um, and for this reason, in pretty much every game that I've run, um, I allow a grace period of... Well, it depends on the game system, and it depends on the players who are at the table and how how much they've encountered the system before. But I allow... Okay, for in- instance, if everyone here had played a couple of campaigns of D&D 5e and were pretty, pretty knowledgeable about the game system, and we started at level 1, I would give the players the entirety of level 1 to play through their character and decide whether or not this is something that they want to actually continue on playing in the campaign. If they decide against that and they want to play a different character, then a completely repercussions-free changing of the character as much as that player wants. Um, that's one example. If we were playing a game system that nobody had played before, I might allow that to last a little bit longer. For instance, whenever we did our Abena game um, in Savage Worlds, I allowed for basically the first at the conclusion of the first two adventures, I allowed that window to stay open. Of if anybody wanted to change their character, they could do it consequence free up until that point. It's kind of like a mulligan. Yes. <laughs> I should have added some swimming and climbing. 
<laughs> I should have just trashed my character TV. Skill, skill. <laughs> this elixir was... I don't know. I, I don't know what you guys are right. bitching and moaning about. Uh, both Magnus and Ingwe were great. They had zero flaws. <laughs> uh, I killed a dragon by myself. <laughs> So, I don't know what your your bird people are whining about not being able to swim and you pacifists. <laughs> Just pick up an axe, baby. Wait, not only did you kill a dragon by yourself, you killed, you killed a yourself. dragon after literally everybody else noped the fuck out. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, basically what I'm saying is... Uh, he has get, no flaws. Get good. <laughs> I've never made a bad character. Ever. All of my characters are amazingly effective. We're not going to talk about the mage game we just played where I played an ineffectual character or the blind summoner. Those didn't happen. That wasn't me. It was me. I've made mistakes. All right. Let's move on to uh, talking about any interesting geek things that are going on. Does anybody have anything they want to start with? Not that it needs any more promotion, but there is this uh, little, little tiny inconsequential game out there called Detroit Become Human. And it's so, I really like games that are very plot and story heavy and you get to make choices. And I know that a lot of times, like for example, in Tall Tale games, your choices matter, but it doesn't really completely overall change the effect of the game. It just changes like, oh, that character might not be there in the end credit scene, la di da. Detroit Become Human is one of the most intense games I have experienced, as well as your choices really matter, and the amount of endings and work that they've put into it is incredible. Also, the score is beautiful. Looking at it from a, a music angle, it is just an immaculate piece of work, and I can't recommend the game enough. It's also like $60, so... Yikes. Someone wants to, like, actually buy it for me? That would no. Be great. Wait, have you not played it? I've been watching a lot of playthroughs, and I have a friend who I've been just like, hey, what if you do that choice? Can, can you do that for me? Hmm. So I would like to experience the game, although I have watched all of it to completion. It's still incredible. It is. It's a really cool game. And I also bought the score. The score is really good. I do some volunteer work with kids, and I am currently master of um, a sort of program slash Arduino based thing called Makey Makey, mm -hmm. and it basically allows you to take a small like board that you can plug things into, and they act as like W A S D, the arrow keys, click and space, and you can like take things out of there and connect it to anything that can form a charge. And recently we set that up to do Windows XP Pinball. And it was just so amazing to watch these kids learn how to program on like the most simplest level and play things that they've never played before. We also taught her how to play Mario with the same program. And it's a cheap thing to start with if you ever want to get into programming. It's how I'm starting my basing. And then you move on from, like, makey-makey to um, these click circuits, and then you can jump right into Arduino, which is actually really cool. And Raspberry Pi, after that or before that, they're kind of on the same level. But it was just so weird to just hold little pieces of tinfoil and pennies and bananas and play pinball with those objects as they were just... It was, it was really cool, and I highly suggest looking into it. That's... M A K E Y space M A K E Y. It's Makey Nikki. That's a, that's a that's a Hawaiian fish. Makey Nikki. Makey Nikki. Nikki. It's just cool and it's really interesting. I don't have anything nearly as as cool as that. E three this year for me personally was pretty cool. Uh, I liked watching the streams of everything in the background while I was like working or doing stuff. A couple highlights for me: RE two remake coming in out. It's gonna be great. Leon's never looked so good. Kingdom Hearts 3. Uh, Kingdom Hearts 3, not for me personally, but... Kingdom Hearts 3! You know, we got a fan at the table. Um, Resident Evil, or, I already said that. Uh, Devil May Cry 5's coming out. Um, and what was very interesting to me... Oh, uh, Cyberpunk, of course, 2077. It's gonna look very good. Mm. By the creators of The Witcher. Uh, but Assassin's Creed Odyssey, which I've... Despite being kind of the history person... I've never liked Assassin's Creed. I've only ever played, like, uh, two. Wouldn't that be because you are a history person? That <laughs> usually, <you're... laughs> usually. 
Um, but I've also just never been a fan of the game itself. But uh, Odyssey, I was doing some some reading. I had a friend talking to me about it. I guess is is actually an RPG versus like an action game now. So I thought that's an interesting turn. I might check it out. Who knows? Plus, it's like ancient Greece. You know, Spartans. Everybody likes Spartans. Kyle, you remember the movie Three Hundred? Remember that movie? Oh, Kyle? do you remember that? Remember the like King Leonidas, where he's he's just he's like kicks him into the hole. This is Sparta. Yeah, <laughs> that's a good meme, man. <laughs> anyway, that's all I got. I, I I hate Assassin's Creed as a as a game franchise, but that one looks interesting. I'll say that. That's all I'll say about it. Yeah, that's sort of right. They're gonna it's gonna let you down. I'll I'll, I'll say. Oh, that I'm too. sure. It There's two things I'll say about I'm sure it. it will. Uh, me and Katie also played this indie game called Unravel 2, and it's really cute, and there's a really quick playthrough. If you have a buddy, you can just co-op your way through it, but it's about little string people making their way through the world and helping some weird spirit people. It's fun. It's a puzzle platformer co-op game. It's couch co-op. We sat down on the couch. We played it. It's it took us like hours. That's pretty nice. Four hours, maybe? Mm-hmm. They also have uh, the first one, too, but I haven't yeah, personally rabble. played that. Uh, Yarny is a good boy. He's a delightful boy. Uh, <laughs> anyone says anything shit about Yarny, you can contact Kyle Perkins at... Uh, yo, add me on Instagram. That's Fox Carrick, F-O-X-K-E-R-I-C. Uh, I, got, I, got, I got pics. I got pictures for you. But Yarny is the creator's childhood um, stuffy, right? Yeah, or like, like, like childhood their, friend. Like a childhood friend. doll, in a way like that. And I thought that was just a really unique thing to do for a game. It's it's a passion project. Like, it's it's out under Activision, which I know what you're thinking. Uh, or EA, but it doesn't matter. Like, it's, it's very much so, like, five people making a game with a lot of love and a lot of heart. I don't really have anything. Uh, I only have one thing I can think of right now. Um, probably, uh, as as all the people around the table know, and as some of our listeners, if we have any left, might know, uh, I'm not that into comics. I'm not a comic boy. Um, but uh, I've been reading, kind of randomly got into um, Ex Machina. It's um, under the Wildstorm imprint, which is owned by DC, but used to be an independent publishing house for comics, I guess. And before that, it was part of Image. Ah, well, I'm learning all of this. Um, came out in 04, uh, Bush administration, and it is, uh, that's important because it's a very political comic. Uh, it's about the world's first and only superhero who decides to quit being a vigilante in New York City and runs for mayor and wins the race. Spoiler alert, it happens like, immediately in the story. Um, and so it's, it's a very interesting kind of like love letter to the city where there's lots of really cool New York City facts being thrown around. Um, the, the, the mayor, the main character, the superheroes, cabinet and advisors and like deputy mayors are, are primary characters. It's a lot of interesting politics and, uh, there is a lot of, there's a lot of flashbacks shown to, um, the great machine was his persona as a superhero. Um, and, uh, what's his name? Mitchell hundred is the guy's name. Um, mayor Mitchell hundred. And so The Great Machine was this vigilante for a couple of years, and the really cool thing that got me hooked, um, it's had some ups and downs as I've been reading through it, I'm about two-thirds of the way through the whole run of the comic, but the most interesting thing is the revelation fairly early on, a uh, minor spoiler, if you want to stop listening now, I'll say that, during the 9-11 attacks, uh, The Great Machine actually stops the second plane. Um, he had, like, retired his hero persona was considering the run for mayor. Um, the attacks, I didn't realize, happened on the primary election day. Um, and so he puts on his suit again and flies up and is able to stop the second plane. Um, and so one of the towers stands. And so it is a very similar um, universe to the actual one we live in now. Um, you got some Patriot Act bullshit. You got fucking Bush in a flight suit going around. Um, but it's different, and significantly so. Uh, it's worth checking out. I, I've enjoyed it. Um, it's, it's my kind of comic where things are very realistic. It's not fucking gonzo ridiculousness, and it's not some comic hero with so many runs and reboots that I feel like I wouldn't know where to begin. It's, this is just kind of a one-off thing. So, yeah, check it out. Um, I'll let you know more about it on a future episode once I finish the whole run. I'm curious how it'll end. All right, guys, what do you say we stop this bullshit and start rolling some dice? Ole, 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 ole. ole, ole. This has been a production of Alien Familiar Media. 
You can find past episodes and more at alienfamiliar.com. You can email us at alienfamiliarmedia at gmail.com. This production is protected under a Creative Commons non-commercial attribution, no derivatives license. Music for this episode is Suburban Outlaw by Forget the Whale and can be found at freemusicarchive.org.